And so my story is just a reminder that the place I am today is nothing I did. And the environment that I live in today is nothing from me. Um, it was it was given to me, and it's a great, great gift. For the first 10 years of his life, Quanah Spence and his twin brother Kai lived in 10 different homes. Their birth mother struggled with a hard life and alcoholism. Today, he shares the story of how some amazing grace saved him, his brother, and ultimately the mother who abandoned him. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast that gives you a front row seat as everyday people share the experiences that change their faith in hopes that they'll also change yours. I'm your host, Stacy McCants, and we pray that God uses this conversation to move you toward Him. Today, Quanah Spence shines a light on adoption and grace in ways you might not expect. Please meet Quanah Spence. All right. Quanah Spence, got you in here, and man, it's good to see you. It's uh, We had coffee a few weeks ago, and it was so good having a spiritual conversation over coffee with you. Brent and I joined you at a local coffee shop and learned a lot of things I didn't know, but welcome. Appreciate it. I'm honored to be here, and I'm glad to be able to extend that conversation. Yeah, so I, in these conversations at these coffee shops that we have, I try not to do the interview there. I try to like, I'm burning up to ask questions there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, no, don't do that yet. But your story is is remarkable. You're currently a college pastor, and you've got a master's theology. You, so you've been to seminary, you've, you've done that. You're way more biblically um, educated than I am, so I'm looking forward to all these insights that you're going to part on us today, but you are a college pastor, yep, and uh, for a pretty big church here locally, and um, I knew you in my former corporate life, and mm-hmm. we got to know each other a little bit there, but we were sort of in different corners of, of the operation, but so getting to know you here, and especially seeing, in you, seeing you in this context is awesome. But you you came up uh, differently. I, talk a little bit about your early life. Yeah, yeah. It was actually, so I spent a lot of time in Oklahoma, but as far as living, I was born in Barstow, California, um, and spent several younger years in California, Southern California, in the Mojave Desert, if uh, any of your listeners are familiar with that. It was not the pretty part of California. I remember... So Barstow, California, any, you know, anybody that's driven through it, anybody that knows anything about it, they just know it's desert. You're walking onto, it wasn't a porch, but out the front door, it's just nothing. It's just dust, tumbleweeds, cactus, literal desert. And so those are my earliest memories out in California. Um, we lived there with my identical twin brother and my, my mother. And so it was just us there. Uh, I did have a uh, half brother and a half sister that lived with us uh, some of the time, and um, so that was that was us. That was uh, that was my earliest memories. And um, I tend to think about it because those were early years. I tend to think about it uh, by where I was in which grade. So I know in in like preschool years, I was different places. Um, I, I wasn't always in Barstow, but from my earliest memories, I know I spent first grade in Barstow. Um, I was there in school. Second grade, I was in Castro Valley, California, which is fairly close to the Bay Area in San Francisco. And so I lived there with my biological father. In third grade, I was back in Barstow, California. Okay, so they were they were not together. No, not at all. Not at all. So I, there's more. I was... Uh, because there is so many details to this story, when I tell it, I tend to go in layers. Okay. And so this is kind of a broad painting with a broad stroke, first layer. Okay. And then there's there's some more granular things that happened as far as the transition. Awesome. Um, if that's okay. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, and so so first grade Barstow, second grade birth, uh, with my, my biological father, uh, Castro Valley. Um, Fourth, uh, third grade, I was back in 
Barstow, California with my birth mother my uh, and my identical twin. Fourth grade, I was in two places. One of those places, I was with my birth mother. It was in Gary, Indiana. If you know anything about Gary, Indiana, you might know that it's where the Jackson 5 is from. Yeah. And so I lived the first part of fourth grade in Gary, Indiana with my birth mother and uh, her boyfriend's family. And uh, my identical twin brother was there with me. And then the second part of uh, fourth grade, I was living in Cherokee, North Carolina with an aunt and her family. And, um, and then fifth grade, I was in Alabama where we are today. And then there's a lot more granularity in the summers in between all of those years. One summer I was with an aunt in, um, Fremont, California. Uh, one summer I was with an aunt in Wyoming, in Lander, I think, Wyoming. It's on the Wind Wind River Reservation. Listeners, I'm Native American. That's where the name Quana comes from. It was named after a guy named Chief Quana Parker of the Comanche tribe. And um, so I was living on a reservation in Wyoming with my aunt for one summer. And that was also what I was doing in North Carolina in fourth grade. That that was, uh, I was on the Cherokee Reservation in fourth grade, living with another aunt who had married a uh, Cherokee. I think those were the major highlights as far as geography and places I was located. That's a lot of places in a short amount of time. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, My first 10 years of life, I was in at least 10 different homes. Um, Mm. You, so I, like I said, I think about it in grades. And so every single year I was in a new home. Um, And then also there was also a lot of summers Typically, every summer I was in a different place. So it, it brought me all over the country, gave me a lot of perspective. You know, you think about being in Gary, Indiana. I was in an all-black school for first part of fourth grade. In Cherokee, North Carolina, I was in an all-Native American school on the reservation. And then I moved to Alabama. I was in an all-white school. And so I got to also see a lot of cultures. Um, yeah, yeah. So there was there was a lot of experience I had in those first 10 years. And and I know uh, we're going to get into this, but the the kind of the primary reason I would say all the transition happened I wasn't in the military. My parents weren't in the military. It wasn't anything like that. My mother was an alcoholic, and she was also just kind of a loner, kind of a drifter. And so uh, we were all over the place. And that's why some of our aunts would take us summers, and they would say, "You need somewhere to stay." And so they would take us in for a summer or so. And that's why we moved to like Gary, Indiana with her boyfriend's family. And um, some of the situations where she was just so severe in her alcoholism, that family members just said, you can't be there. Yeah. And and so there was a whole lot of stuff, but that's a way to, to kind of simplify it. Um, her alcoholism r- really is what resulted in us moving so much and ultimately um, – there was much more that happened as a result. Yeah. How's that affecting you as a young kid? Yeah. You know, as a young kid looking back, um, I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. It was the only thing I knew. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't have any other experience that said otherwise, I guess there could have been moments where I had thoughts of not every other kid does this. Not every other kid's moving to a new school, you know, first day of fourth grade at, in Gary, Indiana, I get surrounded by, five dudes and, and I get beat up, you know, I'm like you new, you new kid, new school. Like, I guess there could have been hints of, I don't think every other kid's experiencing this. Um, but for the most part, I don't ever remember having thoughts of, I don't want to be here or, you know, this was just life. It was normal. Yeah. But there's no roots there. Right. I mean, no, no. like a kid has a room, right? It might not right. be the greatest room in the world, but they got a space that's their own. And, you know, what's that like when you really don't have a place where you kind of got a foundation? Yeah, it was difficult. Yeah. Um, it made me, and I think I still wrestle with this. I think it made me not trust people. Even my birth father, first of all, I didn't, I never met him till second grade. Um, my life is a result of a one night stand. Um, my birth mother met my birth father in California somewhere. They had a one night stand. Uh, she had twins. Um, I remember, you know, at one point, you know, she's extremely poor. She's about to have twins. She's already kind of a drifter. And she was in San Francisco at the time. I think they met and there were, there were people that encouraged her to have an abortion, uh, but she chose to keep us. And so, um, 
but that resulted in a lot of pain and difficulty for her. I mean, she just she's already not equipped to handle yeah uh, this, and and then she gets two kids. At, you know, at, at one moment she's already got a half. Uh, I, at the, I was she already had um, two kids by other folks. So I, like I said, I had a half brother and a half sister. But my birth father didn't know about my brother and I until we were a year old, probably. Oh, so he didn't like know and run. He no, just no, no, didn't no. know at all. He didn't know at all. Wow. Yeah, yeah. She, she found out she was pregnant after they met, and she didn't tell him about us and for for I think a year or so. And I never met him until I was in second grade. Um, and the only reason I met him, and this is where it gets into how I ended up in Alabama. The only reason I met him was because he learned that we were living in Alabama with, with a family that wasn't our own, with no biological family. We were living with a family that was just taking us in. And so he finally got the wherewithal to take his boys back or whatever. And, and that really only lasted, like I said, maybe all of second grade. I can't remember all the details, but I know I spent the majority of second grade with him, but that was it. Ever since second grade, I've never connected with him. Not since then. No, nope. Do you remember much about that? Second grade, yeah, yeah. I remember. You know, people ask me how difficult was it. Do you, you know? Did you? What was each experience like in each place? And I would say there was never any moment where. Now there was one boy, that boyfriend that we lived with in North Carolina, uh, in, in Gary, Indiana. I didn't like him. Um, yeah, that, I'll just I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, there was nobody in any of those places where I was just like I didn't feel great around them. Didn't. You know, I wasn't abused physically or anything like that. But I know living with our father probably felt the most unnatural. Really? Mm -hmm. Even even more so than living with strangers in Alabama. Hmm. Um, and I don't know. I think a large part of that had to do, I don't know all the details. I, I think it just had to do with maybe the woman he married. I think she harbored some resentment Yeah. looking back. Like she didn't sign up for this. And I just remember there, for a young kid in my small mind at the time, I just remember there being anger there. Yeah. So, but other than that, I don't ever remember feeling unwanted in the moment. Yeah. Now, I think those feelings came later. Yeah, but you didn't have a home, right? No, 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 no. I think, like I said, that, those feelings certain came up in my life, like a lot. But I think that came later when my mind could process more. Yeah. So how'd you come to be adopted? Yeah. So I was, uh, I told you already, I had lived in uh, Alabama starting in fifth grade. And that happened as a result. Uh, I told you about an aunt I lived with in the Fremont area in California. Well, that aunt was the only Christian, the only believer that I remember growing up. Now, I'm not saying nobody else was, but but she was intentional. She yeah. taught us John three sixteen. She uh, took us to church, and she also took us to these like Native American Bible camps. the um, The Baptist denomination had these camps that they would allow these Native communities to come in and hold like week long camps for children's church, adult kind of like a uh, a Bible camp for the entire family. Mm -hmm. And it was all Native Americans. And so my aunt took us, my, my brother and I, uh, my brother, his name is Kai, by the way. Uh, so if you hear me refer to Kai, that's my brother. So my aunt took uh, my brother and I to this camp. And we were six at the time, living with her one summer. Took us to this camp. And man, that changed my world. As a six-year-old, I had never been around such loving people. I had never uh, been around such an environment of affection teaching young native kids that were, all, I mean, people like me all around. It has to be such a contrast from what life has been that whole time. It was, it was. And especially this family from Alabama, they were world changers. Even in that one week that I met them when I was six, they, so it was, um, a father and a mother from Alabama. It was a, a he was a pastor. His wife and his three daughters. And so it was the Spence family. They came and they were there to teach Bible studies. They were there, there to um, lead children's church. And that's where I was impacted. So the three daughters, they were just incredible with kids. One of the daughters did um, 
she had this, she was a ventriloquist. <laughs> yeah. And she, and still today, I and mean, she incredibly talented with communicating spiritual truths to children. And so that's where the Lord got a hold of me. It was the first time I ever remember hearing anything about the gospel, Jesus, how much he loves me. And I know in my small mind, I, I didn't comprehend everything. But the first time I heard it, I knew I wanted it. And so that was the starting point. You know, I, I'm okay to go as far as to say that was the moment I was saved. I don't think it's necessary. I, I know I'm saved, but as far as marking on the calendar, I always tell people, hey, don't stress about that. Look at the fruit today. Yeah. Um, but I do think that that was a starting point. Um, they sh- share the gospel so faithfully and so clearly that a young person could understand it. And um, and so I responded. Yeah, it, so- it sounds like, you know, I, I, when my wife doesn't water our tomato plants, little ones out there, the thing, the, the soil gets powdery and they just droop over. But you hit it with water and by like an hour later, you've got this upright, mm. it just needed it just needed it, right? It needed the water. It needed the life yeah. poured into it. And it sounds just as I'm listening from this side of the table that you were just starved and all you needed was some water yeah. and they poured it into you and it lit you up. It sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Even little memories of like them just like sitting uh, or I just have little memories of for instance, standing around a campfire and one of the daughters just coming up and putting their arms around us, you know, and, you know, they had already loved on us so much that week, but just that affection, just yeah. that connection, it, it made all the difference. And, and so I'll forever remember that summer meeting them. Well, there was a conversation that took place that summer and they, the, the family began to hear our story. My aunt, like I said, the only believer I remember growing up was was compelled, I think, by the Lord to, to pretty much divulge our whole story, tell them our predicament, and then cap it off by saying, you know what, you could probably have them. Mm. Th- that was how it was told to me uh, later on in life. And I know there were more details than that that, that probably weren't conveyed or remembered by me, but that's ultimately what happened. They heard our story they saw our predicament and they were given an opportunity and they took it. And so that following basically a few months later, we were put on a plane to Alabama. And so it was a a situation where, um, it didn't last long term. It was actually only until the end of the summer that we stayed in Alabama because at that point, our biological father heard about it and said, no, they're coming back with me. And like I told you already, that only lasted a short time before that was done. So the Spences, they took us in for uh, 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 probably about three months. We came to Alabama. We lived. I mean, I remember so clearly their green carpet and their <laughs> orange chairs and their dogs. And they took us to church on Sundays. And, and man, it was... You know, for there was one aspect where it was just another home, right? Yeah. That's all what we always knew. Of course, we're in a new home. That's what always happens. But the other side of it was, was we never experienced love like this and care like this. And so when we left, it was hard, even for a seven-year-old at the time. Yeah. Really hard. And um, ultimately what happened was the whole cycle of us moving to different homes began. Like I said, some of what I've already told you was a part of this story, you know, moved second, third, fourth, you know, we're in different homes all over the country. And it wasn't until summer before I turned 10 that we saw the Spences again. So this is almost three years later. We're now with that same aunt in California and she takes us to another camp that's for native Americans. That's a Bible camp in the summer a week long. And so she drives us from California to Oklahoma and it's a much bigger camp. I'm talking probably 2,000 or more Native Americans are coming to this thing in Oklahoma to, you know, have this Bible camp. Well, I know that the Spencers are going to be there. My aunt tells me, and, you know, I'm nine at the time. And so I'm, I've grown in my ability to understand what's going on. But I'm still, I've still got a small mind. And so I'm driving from California or 
Uh, I'm riding from California to Oklahoma in this vehicle. And I remember looking out the window thinking this car going by may have the Spences in it. They're going to the same place we're going. Maybe this car has the Spences in it. So, so she had been communicating with them and, and yes. connected about well, going to this camp? actually, they had not really communicated about that. I just know she knows that they're going to be there because they lead at these camps. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so she tells us this. And it could have been she hopes they're going to be there um, or, or something like that. But no, there was no communication uh, with them by her. And, but, but we, we think they're going to be there. We're told they're going to be there. And so, man, I'm, you know, in my small mind, I'm thinking every car drives by, yeah. they might be in there. And I'm just so excited to see them. And, um, even stopping at gas stations, I'm looking around so intensely and, uh, you know, it's a pretty long road trip for a kid and we never see them on the drive there. Obviously they're coming from a different part of the country. And so when we get there, we, uh, we don't see them. There's a big camp you know, 2000 Native Americans coming. And so we, uh, they feed us at this big cafeteria. And so I'm thinking, surely they're going to be in the cafeteria. You know, everybody's got to eat probably at the same time. And for a nine-year-old, that's just the obvious next place to see them. Well, they weren't there either. So we were a little bit disappointed. Maybe they weren't going to be here. And, um, and little did I know that their cabin had their own kitchen and things like that. So of course they're not going to be there. Well, it came time for Children's Church, and that's what they do. That's why we're there, and that's why all the kids. There was probably 600 kids lined up by the doors of B.B. McKinney Chapel. I know you don't know where that is, but it's this big chapel that they always had Children's Church in. And so, you know, 600 Native American kids line up. Well, we get there. It, I can't remember how early. We were the first ones in line, though. We were literally looking at the doors. They were locked, and we were waiting for you know, right today I'm looking back and I, we're probably waiting three hours, probably 30 minutes. You know, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> in my, in my mind, I was thinking it was forever, but we got there so early because we were so excited to see the Spences and they actually saw us before children's church started and they you know peeked through the window and, and, and saw us and they let us in early. They let us sit on the front row and they even let us get on the stage while they were doing some of their children's church things. And so we just thought we were big time, Yeah, you know? And, um, anyways, long story short, at the end of that camp, they hear that the whole story of us moving from home to home had started back up, that nothing really had changed. And, you know, they, they realize how much they still care for us. And they decided, all right, we're going to make this happen. We're going to make this stick this time. And so that same deal that, that basically by the end of the summer, we were put on a plane and flown to Alabama, and we were there ever since. So how was your faith? I mean, I know you're a kid. This event happened when you were six years old, and from six to ten, you continue with the thing where you're moving around or whatever. Were you able to go to organized religion? Or were you able to go to church anywhere? Or? I only went during that that phase between six and ten Yeah, when I had met the Spences and before we were living with them full-time. During that phase, it was very little. Yeah. Um, the only time I remember going is when I was still with that aunt. Her husband was actually a, a pastor. And so during the, and, but that was not all the time. That was actually very little of the time. So um, very little, but um, I don't remember anything too dark during those years. Okay. You know, um, there were certainly dark things that happened, but as far as my faith impact, there was, it was probably stagnant. But at the same time, it wasn't in opposition. I believe I was graced by having solid convictions at an early age. Yeah. I just remember earliest memories always being a, even a child of conviction, of following what was right. Now, I've got stories of doing wrong, but, you know, so does everybody. Don't we all? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, but I just, in general, I remember being a man of conviction, a, a child of conviction. And so I think that's indicative and evidence of saving faith. Yeah. And so y you were removed from a really good situation where you were exposed to love and, and basically the presence of Christ, right? And um, very little of that happened in that, that window, but now you're back. 
Yeah. So I came back and I was thrown into a family that loved me. They loved the Lord. My um, now dad was a pastor in a very traditional church, went to Sunday morning worship, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Um, my dad is the godliest guy I know by far because I got to see him every day. Like my dad is also one of the most, like one of the hardest working guys I've ever met. He was a um, pastor, like I said, but also retired last year. Was it last year? Year before last from a company he worked at for 50 years. And so he was bivocational in his ministry. But on top of that, he uh, lived on a, a 42 acre farm, a, kind of a hobby farm, but still a farm where he, he had horses, cows, um, he had a garden that he took care of. Um, so he basically had three full-time jobs. And then in the summers, he would take his family on mission trips yeah. to other states. And so he had all the reasons in the world to say, God, I'm doing your work. I can take it easy in the mornings or in the evenings. Or, But no, if ever I woke up early enough to come downstairs and see him before he woke us up, he was most likely praying or reading his Bible, like sometimes out loud. And he was just so faithful. If you ever looked at his Bible, even at his office, you would see tick marks in the back of his Bible. And he would just make another tick every time he read through his Bible. Hmm. And it was full. And so, and, and it was oftentimes in the evenings or, or, you know, before they went to bed where I would walk by my parents' bedroom and they were together praying out loud. And oftentimes it was for us. And so that just made a huge impact looking back. It, um, so I, I think I caught more than was taught to me. And so I would say in a large part, even from the age of 10, when I came with them full time to the age of about 17, close to when I was about to move out of the house, there was probably a lot of stagnancy as far as my faith, but it was also stagnancy that underneath it all, there was a lot building up. I was seeing so much of my dad. I was hearing the word preach faithfully every Sunday. He, my dad is um, sometimes hard to, to communicate with. He's deaf for one. And number two, he's just old school. But what he does is, is faithful to the Bible. So I, I got to hear him three times a week, typically open the Bible and just teach faithfully through it. And so I just got a really good foundation of scripture and I got to see what I think the church should, should be about. And that is being on mission, but also being about understanding what his word says, because that's really what's going to end up fueling these things that impact the world and impact you as a person. So he was faithful to the scriptures. He was faithful to his family. He was faithful to obey the Lord. And so by the time I hit 17, that's when I would say ownership of my faith or really took hold. Yeah, and you know, throughout that time, whether you're engaging personally with God or not, He's being imprinted on you. Yeah, in, on a daily basis. Yeah, right. Whether and that hasn't been the case up until that point. Right. Yeah, I spent a lot of time with my dad, and part of that I think is he knew we needed it. We had very little attachment to a father figure. And so um, every single Sunday, we got in the church bus with him because he still drove the church bus for our small church. And he would drive around the community and pick up kids who wanted to come to church. And we would drive the church bus with him. So I saw him. That's another job he did. And, um, and so he'd do, he'd do that in his suit because he was about to go preach. And um, I also saw him every Saturday without failure, except maybe for a handful of times throughout those, I would, I'd say I, I spent eight years full time in the Spence family as, as their child, um, throughout those eight years, like I said, except probably for a handful of times, every single Saturday, he woke us up with a knock and he said, boys, get your work clothes on every single Saturday. <laughs> and you know, in the moment, those words were, were the death of me yeah, every <laughs> single Saturday. And I'm talking like 7 a.m. Boys, 
get your work clothes on. And I can still hear those words from him in my head. And my brother and I, we would always fight like, you respond. No, you, because we always had a, we always shared a room. And we would fight like, no, you respond, you respond, you know. I, and, um, but inevitably he would stay there until we woke up, you know, we, he wouldn't let us sleep in much. And so he woke us up, we, we put our work clothes on literally, and we'd work out there outside on the farm most days from morning till the sun was going down. And man, we spent so much time with him and we saw his hard work, We but looking back, we also saw his faithfulness. And so those were really hard days, but I think looking back, it made all the difference in our life. So Jesus taught us, and when when he, I don't know, I feel like when he came around and he started calling God Father, Mm -hmm. it changed the way people began to view God, less of a wrathful, you know, you're not following my laws and offering me proper sacrifice and and that sort of thing. But when when he became father, it it, it changed, right? It changed yeah. the way. I think it changes the way we view God. And if you think of a good father that loves his children, the things that he would not only do for them in the ways that he loves them, but also the things that he teaches them the ways that he disciplines, but disciplines for their good, you know, not because he's ticked off about something. Right. I don't think you really had a good handle on what father meant. Not at all. But it sounds like God brought you into a place where when Jesus says we, he's our father, he's like a really good dad. Yeah. You suddenly got, a new understanding of what that is. Does that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. Um, I make that correlation a lot, uh, in my ministry and, um, it's true. Like it, I didn't know what it was like. Um, had I continued my life without that fatherly figure, uh, I think I'd be in a different place, uh, as a person. And so, um, yeah, he taught me a lot about just the world, about work, about the faith, but I caught more than he taught, and just the the, um, the lifestyle I saw from him, how the, you know the priorities that I saw set, I saw set by him. Yeah, I, I saw what it meant to be a father, to care for the least of these. Um, yeah, you're right. So it sounds like he imprinted the spiritual life on you as you were entering manhood. Yeah, literally, 17 to 19 is probably when I started owning my faith, um, I would say, completely. Yeah. Um, 17, pretty impactful moment. Um, one message I heard, and it was just, it, it was a senior, I was a senior in high school, and um, someone came and, and spoke on, it was essentially on witnessing, telling people what the Lord has done in your life. And I just remember thinking, I've never done that. I've never been vocal very much about my faith other than, you know, in Sunday school, answering some Bible questions. You know, I could do that pretty well. But as far as in the world witnessing, I'd never done that. And so when I saw people giving examples of how that had impacted other people, man, I was set ablaze. I um, I became what I've heard uh one pastor say, now I own it. I, was, I became uh, ignorance on fire. I was on, <laughs> I was set ablaze, but I was so ignorant about a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, but the Lord used that to kind of usher me on this trajectory towards serving him. And really when I was 19, that culminated into an official response to a call to ministry. And um, my dad was a huge part of that. He, you know, I was in a pastor's home growing up, but he never pushed you know, teaching anything. He never pushed ministry on me at all. Like, not that I remember. He showed it to me. He modeled it for me. But he never said, like, things like, this is going to be you one day. You know, um, that really came completely of myself. So 15 to 18-year-old boys are not necessarily pondering ministry. Were you a typical 15 to 18-year-old kid? I would say say mostly from 15 to 
to 17. And then 17, the Lord really started getting a hold of me. I, I did see from age 17 to, you know, 17, 18, for those two years, I saw some battling within myself to, to pursue things that my hormones wanted to pursue. Sure. And my, you know, and, but really age 19, it was a clear call to ministry. Really? Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I was at that time. So like I said, 17, the Lord started getting hold of me. So I, I was, I had begun getting asked by folks to start helping out with like youth. Um, I, I was really graced with a good friend group. I think without that friend group, I would be in another place. I would have pursued that path, like I said earlier, of pursuing things I was that were would have fulfilled appetites and would have been pleasurable, you know, and not and and, and so I I tried to pursue some of those things, but I never got down very far because my friends wouldn't let me. And man, some of those friends even today are still just evidence of God's grace in my life. God has providentially brought these people in my life, just like he did my parents to keep me on a tr- track, I think, of, of glory, glorifying God. One of my best friends he, today is a, be, uh, is a friend that I met in fifth grade, the year that I was adopted, the, the year that I came to Alabama. I met him in fifth grade, and he's been one of my best friends ever since. And he's just an example of one of my friends who, have, uh, who know me really well. Um, and who have helped me just on this path of serving the Lord and uh, honoring Him. And so um, when I was 19, that group of friends and I were helping out this youth group. And, you know, we were there leading discussions, things like that. And the speaker came in, and he was talking about, uh, you know, several things that weekend. It was a multi-service kind of deal. And one night, I think it was the final night, and I wasn't, I'm not one to get uber-emotional except when I'm talking about my story, yeah. as you saw earlier. <laughs> um, so, and I'm just not, even even when I do get emotional, I'll, I'll probably try to tuck it away. But man, uh, one night it just struck me what the Lord was, what the Lord really had been doing in my life for a couple of years at that point. And that is just provoking me towards being a better witness. And so... That night, heard the message, and it was it was about just serving the Lord. It wasn't necessarily about a call to ministry, but that's how it hit me. Yeah, and I remember when the Holy Spirit kind of just invaded my space. I remember even thinking that if, you know, my head was down, I was getting emotional. I remember even thinking, up if I looked up quick enough, I'm going to see the Holy Spirit standing in front of me. That's how <laughs> how dense it felt. Wow. Um and so that was just a, a memorable spiritual kind of uh, moment in my life. What, what was it like? I mean, tell me the detail of that. I mean, was it, this is three seconds? Was it 15 seconds? Was Man, it hard to gauge? I, it was, it was short, but um, it, it was, it was impactful. It was, like I said, did just, you feel was, differently? Did you feel lighter or, or, or like super energized? I mean, what was it like? Well, I think, you know, when I read the scriptures, you talk, you, you know, there's, and I know people believe differently on this, but there is a category in Scripture when it talks about the Holy Spirit um, came upon them. Now, I think that's different than the Holy Spirit indwelling you, because I think that happens at salvation. But there are a category where it says the Holy Spirit came upon them, and I think that's what happened. Uh, it was a moment where I just felt the Spirit so tangible that the Lord was speaking to me so clearly through His Word that it was just... Like I had no doubt that he was on, like he was on me about serving him that day, and so I spoke to the pastor, and he just encouraged me to talk to my dad, and he was the perfect person to talk to, and my dad was such an encouragement throughout that whole um, process. He uh, he didn't get overly excited. He also didn't, you know, uh, he. But looking back, he was very excited, but he didn't show it at the time. He just said. He didn't say it, but it was as if he said, we'll see. And so he started giving me opportunities to preach. And then I started getting other opportunities to preach in smaller churches. And so it, you know, there, there can be moments where somebody thinks that the Holy Spirit's telling them something and it's not affirmed through the local church or it's not affirmed through the, the scriptures but I kept seeing things affirmed. People were giving me opportunities. I kept having the spirit just tug at my heart for serving him. And so it wasn't long. Um, 
like I said, I was called into ministry at 19 and literally probably a few months later, I was living in New Orleans and attending seminary. And that's where I, uh, that's where I actually got one degree before moving up to North Carolina later on uh, in my seminary career to pursue my MDiv in North Carolina. And so it was pretty rapid. Like I said, from 17 to 19, the Lord really started taking me to a place where I was owning my faith. And it seemed to be a spiritual growth spurt. And I think it was a result of what I had seen witness for so many years with my dad and others. Um, and so it, from, from 19 on, it was a, from 19 uh, to the point I was, uh, I think 22 was a massive spiritual growth spurt. Uh, theologically, convictionally, just a lot of areas that the Lord. I was still ignorant in a lot of ways, but I. We I, all are. And, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and reminder: I, I don't care if you're the Pope; you're still an infant in your spirit. Yes. In your spiritual walk. That's a good word. Relative to to the eternal God, right? Yes. But you know that that Holy Spirit moment. I don't want to throw it in reverse too much on this thing, but it was a pivotal time. It was a pivotal thing that happened. It was, it was pronounced yeah. for you. It was a different feeling. It was, you know, we always talk about Paul on the road to Damascus because that's one of the most um, vivid right. examples of just a bam, and, yeah. and, and you're changed. Right. And so I've had a few of those. And when I look back on it, I've had a few times where I believe God has spoken to me, and I've talked about it on here before, but it's um, it's beyond just a random thought. It's so imprinted on me that months and years later, I recall it as vividly as when it happened. Um, I remember a couple of Holy Spirit moments, though, I feel like happened where, and this is going to sound weird, but literally my surroundings looked different. They looked more alive. They looked more vivid. Um, I don't know what that is. I, we can say it's the Holy Spirit, but I, so I don't know what physiologically might have happened inside to cause that perception to change. But it was a feeling that I had on the inside, and if I had to describe it and, and I was being interrogated, I would have to say that I felt, um, you know how you feel if you get up in the middle of the night and you drink a, a glass of cool water, mm -hmm. and it's like it cools you on the inside? Right. It was like that a little bit. And so I'm really interested to hear what the specifics are of, of anybody who has those kinds of experience yeah. and what you recall it made you feel like. And look, because I, I know it's not just happened to me. <laughs> you right. know, I know it's happened to a lot of people. And people wonder, oh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles on Pentecost, and then they, you know, they would pray, and, and, and they would come upon other people as they were being baptized. And, you know, when Paul... Uh, sort of deliver the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, and and you know there was the the tongues of fire and speaking in tongues, and there's all kinds of different things that have happened for different people, um, and and people wonder, as Christians, it's like I don't know if I've had a Holy Spirit moment, and I don't know that they happen a ton, but for me it was almost like there was some door or window that like cracked open to heaven just a bit. Right, yeah. And you just got enough that that it really blew you up. It, yeah. it, it energized you in a long-lasting way, and you wonder what it'll be like when that's the place we live in all the time. Right. Yeah, I, I love how you describe some of that. I think that really gets at uh, that moment I told you about um, it was certainly special. It was certainly memorable. It certainly is something I continue in my ministry to think back on and say, Lord, you've worked in an incredible way in that moment. And it's helped me to very, very rarely 
uh, if ever doubted my calling in the ministry. Yeah. And that's special to me for someone who is a skeptic and doubter, um, naturally that is special to me. Yeah. There are moments that change you and that you can say, well, I can logically think through all these things, but I'm just telling you, I know what happened. Right. And it's hard for me to explain, but I can't get past it. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I hope more Christians can experience that, but the reality is not everybody either knows how to articulate it or just doesn't feel it the same way. Or and even it, recognize it. Sometimes. Right. Recognizes it. And, and I would just, I try to, you know, and as a pastor, if I were to counsel somebody that is concerned about not filling those, I, you know, I just try to remind them, look, we, we've been given the words of God through divine revelation in the Bible. And so when you open the Bible, you're hearing from God. And so if your affections don't feel just like mine, just be reminded God's communicating through to you in specific ways. And even if he does, even if I do feel like the spirit is speaking to me, whether it's regard to call of ministry or something, it better be backed up by the word of God. Because if the spirit's telling me to get divorced from my wife, I can tell you that's not from the spirit of that's God. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the spirit, not, all right. But that's not. <laughs> not backed up in scripture. And yeah, so I try to counsel people that way when I, you know, I want to be sober minded, but I also want to say, I don't want to discount what happened in that moment. You know, no, and people should surface those. But, but you, you know, the thing about it is, you, you think, all right, so why did that happen to those guys and not me? I, I, I think of uh, Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa of Calcutta, and you know, she remarked that she didn't really, <laughs> she did the work that she did to glorify God, but she, for I don't know how long, felt no, hmm. and you would think that she would feel right. super spiritual and super connected and have many Holy Spirit moments that, that sort of propel her to continue that kind of, that kind of work. Right. Yeah. And, and, and she didn't, she didn't have that. And which is remarkable to think about. So, you know, God works on his own time and in his own way. And in, in those moments, I think those are things that we probably needed at that time to get us to a new place. Right. Maybe Mother Teresa didn't need that necessarily to do the work she was. Right. I don't know. I don't know how he works, right? Because right. it, it fully, I learn a little bit more every day. But, you know, I would just say if there's somebody who doesn't feel like they've had that whole experience, Holy Spirit experience, it's okay. Right. It doesn't change anything. Just remain faithful. And, and maybe that'll happen one day and maybe it won't. But it doesn't change our faithfulness to him and it doesn't change that he's pleased when we do things that please him mm -hmm. and um, that we're not saved or in alignment with him. We should focus on being in alignment with him. And if that happens one day to you, then awesome. And you should share that with people. But if not, um, it's not an indication that you're not in a good spot necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring that out. And yeah. I know we're kind of sidebarring on the Holy Spirit, that's but great. hey, the Holy Spirit's a pretty good thing, to, cool that's, thing to sidebar on, right? That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, so you got your call to ministry, and so you, you, you've gotten a couple of degrees, and, and now what? Yeah, and I do want to make a point to, to make, a, make a correlation between my story and, and just how the Lord kind of showed me the spiritual growth spurt. You know, the first time I ever shared my story, what I have told you now, is uh, when I was 17, the kind of, it was kind of, again, I, I know I told you about a guy that came and spoke and it was impactful, but it was also in that same season where it was the first time I had ever shared my story with anybody. Like nobody knew that about me that I went to school with. Really? Nobody. I mean, I, wow. I know they knew things. They, you know, probably just knew generally they were adopted. And a lot of times when people hear that, you just don't ask about it until they bring it up. And I never brought it up. I never knew First of all, I was probably wrestling with a lot myself and still processing or avoiding, you know, all the above. But it wasn't until I was 17. I was actually in Italy, in Rome, on a class trip uh, with my senior class, which my dad made me pay for. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, That's a good lesson right there. Yeah, so we were. I was on this trip, and it's kind of funny how this happened but the Lord used it. But, but we were at the Coliseum, a group of friends of ours that I had graduated high school with. Um, 
we hadn't graduated yet, but this girl that I had a huge crush on just starts asking me all these questions about my story. And I'm sitting there like, why do you want to know this? I've never told this to anybody, but it was this girl I had a huge crush on. So I was like, I better do it. You know, that's and, why you raised all that money, right? <laughs> right. It, it, it probably was. Um, and, uh, and the Lord really used that to show me how sharing my story can impact somebody else. Yeah. I think there's probably more I could unpack about that moment. Um, as far as what it did to me, like it is the first time I ever heard myself say it. First time I ever got to reflect on what was going on. And it was the first of many. And the Lord really used that to bring me out of my shell. I was very, very, almost painfully shy growing up. Mm-hmm. A very insecure about a lot of stuff. Probably well, no surprise. Which is someone. understandable. Yeah. That's right, given and, the background. And so, you know, all the people that I went to school with um, knew that and, you know, probably just thought it was personality things. But anybody that hears my story probably knows it's probably a few other things. And so the Lord really used that to help me come out of my shell personality wise, but also helped me um, get to the point where I can start telling other people things that help them grow in their faith. And so um, I saw a very clear parallel between opening up about my story and opening up about the gospel. Mm -hmm. And, um, And so went on the track towards ministry, went to New Orleans, got a degree from New Orleans Seminary down there, um, went to North Carolina and got my MDiv at Southeastern Seminary uh, up there. And um, and so I've worked in churches for the past several years, but I've also done, like my dad, bivocational work. I worked at a at the corporate company you mentioned that yeah. we were at together, and we were I was there for seven years. And I've done other jobs that were completely different than ministry, but all throughout, since I was 19, I've pretty much been in a church doing something. Isn't it cool, though, how he um, how he stretches you into new places and develops new skills that you're going to use for the kingdom later on? You're a quiet, shy, somewhat insecure person. Girl, you got a crush on wants to know more about and starts pulling stuff out of you. Next thing you know, you're telling your story. Next thing you know, you're like that had an effect and that's the thing, a gift that God has given me that I I didn't know until now. And, and, and now you're a college pastor, right? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool how it works? It is cool, man. I, and I, I tell people this story a lot as far as, uh, you know, people in my ministry and, um, it just is always a reminder of all the things that we experience in life, how the Lord could use those. Um, it really brings to life the Romans eight. He's working all things, together for our good and his glory. And, um, my life's a evidence of that. It's a, uh, it's certainly a reminder of his grace and his sovereignty and his plan. Yeah. So now you are, well, let me get back up for, for a second. Have you had any contact with your family, your biological family? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I don't know how long you want this podcast to be, but, <laughs> well, we- um, oh man. Okay. So basically for 20 years, I only talked to my birth mother for one year. And that was, I think in seventh grade, it was on the phone. And, um, it was essentially, uh, a quick call to say, um, I think she was asking us to come on a trip with her, but it was also in years where it was probably not the wisest thing to do. And so the Spences didn't say you can't go. But I had the wherewithal and the ability to understand it was probably best if we stayed. Yeah. And so in 20 years, the only time I spoke to her was to say, it's probably best if we stay here. And that was it in 20 years. And so in 2016, I'm, uh, you know, I've got a seminary degree at the time. I uh, have been married um, in 2016, 20 years since I've seen her in person. Uh, you know, haven't really talked to her in those 20 years. I get a phone call from a hospital in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they basically say, your mother's been rushed to the hospital. She's pretty much uh, predicted not to make it. Mm. And um, she tells me, you know, it's as a result of her alcoholism. Yeah. You know, and she had esophageal varices. Basically, she was bleeding out. And she had virtually no blood. The hospital was basically giving her no hope. And so I said, there was a 
few things that were said, but essentially the message was do everything you can to keep her alive. That's what I said to her. And I got off the phone. I got a plane ticket for me, my brother, and my wife. And we flew out to New Mexico for about a week, uh, actually probably about two weeks. And that story is is so memorable. Um, it's so crazy, really. But when we flew out there, we were trying to get there as quick as we can because yeah. we're told she's probably not going to make it. And so we get to the hospital. She, They tell us, well, miraculously, she's still alive. And so I remember walking down the hallway to her hospital room and... I just, you know, all the feelings, all the, just the crazy thoughts, like it's been 20 years, like she's about to probably die. Mm -hmm. Like what, what are we going to do? And man, when we walked into that room, my brother and I were walking in first, my wife was behind us and we walked in and now she was hooked up. I mean, hooked up to the max. She had tubes down her throat, tubes coming out of her everywhere, wires hooked up. I mean, it was a sight to see, but when she saw us as you know, she probably wasn't fully coherent, but when she saw my brother and I walk in the room, she almost stood out of that bed. Wow. And it was incredible to see my birth mother, who, when I was a child, was my mom, right? You yeah. love your mom. You don't rec recognize she's what she's doing to you if it's bad. Yeah. You just know she's your mom That's and you love mom. her. Yeah. And so those feelings start coming back, um, just being reminded of who she is. And just the miracle of our story. And in this moment, we are experiencing something, right? And we know it, especially when she sees us. And 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 then day by day, she doesn't go worse. Wow. She doesn't get worse. She gets better. <laughs> and the doctors keep seeing her vitals pick up. So they're giving her blood and it's it's sticking. I mean, it, it, like things are improving. And, you know, we're, they're still not giving her a ton of hope. But then she gets off the ventilator. She gets, she keeps getting better. And at Did one you guys point, like pray over this? Oh deal? God, we had like people all over the nation praying for her. We were praying nonstop. Uh, we, cause I had two goals when I, when I, when the hospital called me, you know, I'm, I, I have a minister's heart, but I also have a son's heart. And I said, I got two goals. So keep her alive. My goal is to tell her I forgive her and to tell her God forgives her. And so I got to tell her that. And so we're, we're telling her these things as, as you know, in between all her prodding in the hospital and we had people all over the country praying for her yeah. all over the place. I mean, it, uh, we had people sharing our Facebook posts to, to like everywhere. And so, you know, praise God throughout our story, we had connections all over the country. And, and so a lot of those folks were praying for her. And at one point the nurses were saying, you're like a miracle to all of us. To, to the doctors and nurses, they were, you know, she was, I remember her vividly. And I think I wrote it down, you know, pastors tend to write stuff down. They make you later. And so I remember writing that down when the nurse said, you're like a miracle to all of us. And so, um, she walked out of that hospital. That's incredible. Uh, probably about a week later and she lived for about three more years. And that whole story is another crazy story. And so we flew back home. We stayed in contact with her this time because we had begun having these gospel conversations with her. We, of course, told her we forgive her um, and that we wanted these latter years to, to represent that. And so we're, you know, we're giving her Bibles. We're helping her think through some spiritual things, and she's taking it in. And um, in 2019 the same deal happens. She gets rushed to the hospital and this time it's to the point where it's probably not going to, it's probably going to do her in this time. And so in 2019, I was out in New Mexico a handful of times. I mean, we were going out there pretty consistently. I was probably out there three or four times. The corporate company you and I used to work at, they let me have some extra PTO and I was working remotely out there. Some taking some extra days off. I think I burned through all my PTO in about six months. Month, the first six months of the year. <laughs> and so, I mean, they were very flexible with me and, um, and I just had to do it. We were out there taking care of her and we knew it was kind of a getting to an end of life situation. Yeah. And there were some other factors that had us out there and just making sure that we could provide some oversight in her latter days. And so 
we were out there pretty regularly and it got to the point where well, I can't take any more time off. We can't just keep flying out here every time she goes in the hospital because she's in the hospital all the time. And so me, my brother and my wife, we decide to fly her to Alabama and to move her here. And that was a crazy, crazy decision for us to make. And, you know, my, my wife and I at the time had not been married too long. And, and for a young couple like us, it was a lot to take on. Uh, We actually had family members really concerned about us, about that decision. And, you know, we didn't know if she was going to live two weeks or two years, you know, we just didn't know. Like she has already proven to be kind of a fighter. And, and, um, and so we flew her to Alabama to live with us and I'm having to work at home a lot. Uh, my wife is a nurse and so she was able to take care of her a lot inside of our home and really do a lot for her. But she lived with us for um, about two months before she passed away. And so she was in hospice in our, in our home. Wow. And during those, those two months, we shared so much about the scriptures, about grace. Grace was the topic that she really had to get used to. Mm-hmm. And she recognized she lived a life of recklessness. She had lost her children. You know, um, my I told you about a half brother I had when I was younger. He committed suicide when he was eighteen. Mm. Uh, and I remember that I was in third grade. It was one of the years I was living in Barstow, and I remember getting off the school bus, walking to our home, and seeing our mother crying. And brother died. I remember going to his funeral and. So she had, especially with her children, just dark things happen. And so she knew she lived a life where she could not comprehend the grace of God for years. And so I remember reading to her the story of the woman at the well, where Jesus kind of just peers into this woman who had lived a reckless life, peers into her heart, and just shows so much grace. And I remember reading that to her one day and just looking up at her and tears coming down her eyes. And so those were some sweet days. They were really, really difficult. And I would say some, some of the most difficult days of my life were in those months, um, just with my wife, the dynamic there. And this was like a new new world to her. She was kind of a, a loner living out West, uh, different culture, different ethnicity. She's full blooded native American. And, um, and so she's coming to Alabama to live and, and it was just a different world. She lived differently than us. Did you know? did she get the message? Did she yes. consume that? Yeah, she really did. She really she really did. Now, I would say only the Lord knows her heart, but I I have confidence to say she was redeemed, she was accepted, and that we'll see her again. So she she it took, I think, years for her to get the concept of grace that we don't work our way into heaven. Yeah, that's the thing for people, especially that's a, that's a thing that for people who had a rough life like that, <clears throat> it's hard to, it's hard to get there. Right. Yeah. And I think she was there. Um, but I think she got to the point where the grace of God overwhelmed her. She saw her twin boys who she had basically, a, you know, Abandoned. Let him go, yeah. And we took care of her at the end. And I'm not that's only a grace of God. That's not to boast what we did. That's just to say God did a mighty work in our life and in hers. And um and so I think the Lord helped us preach grace through the word, but also with our lives. And say, look, what we forgive you. God forgives you. And we're doing this because we love you and because he loves you. And we're compelled by his love to do this for others, including our birth mother, who some people might not say deserved it. But to think about this whole story of her in this world of self-gratification and no consequences, it seems like, uh, having these children and the children are removed and end up in a place that's safer for them these very children, God using those children to bring her to him mm. is an amazing, that is, that is just straight up a God. Story. It was one of the most memorable moments in that time was, I told you about that big camp in Oklahoma where about 2000 native Americans come. Mm-hmm. Well, she got to travel with us to Oklahoma. That was the month before she passed away. It was in August 
of that year. And so she was able to travel. She was healthy enough to travel with us to Oklahoma. Now she was in very, very poor health. We had to roll her everywhere in a wheelchair, but we wanted her to experience that um, because it's what really ultimately helped change our life to put us in a place where we heard the gospel, where we met the Spences. And we also wanted her to connect with the Spences. And we waited till we were at the camp to do that. You know, she was only right down the road while we, when she was here in Alabama, but we waited till we were in Oklahoma to connect her with the Spences because she held some bitterness towards them for years. Really? Yeah. With how things turned out. And, um, but ultimately I've got a picture, a beautiful picture of her shaking their hands. And they spent a lot of time together during that week. And I remember at one point my mother and my birth mother were both looking at native American jewelry together. And I just snapped a picture and I said, this is something I would never, I, this is something I never thought I would see. Mm. And in addition to that, she got to see me on this massive stage at this native American camp preaching to over 2000 native Americans. And she was on the front row mm. and I was preaching grace and I was preaching the gospel. And so I think it was just, uh, she even said like, I wish I knew this stuff existed. Like it probably would have changed my life. And, you know, I was able to tell her it will change mine. And I want you to be grateful for that. Um, and there's still time for it, for it to change yours. And so that, like, those were just moments during those months that we got to share with her. And she passed away um, the next month. You know, she just, uh, we knew it was coming. She was in hospice and, um, and, and the time came. And I remember even that morning, the morning she passed away, she had a little bit of consciousness and, um, and we were just talking about the gospel when we're talking about grace, we're talking about forgiveness and, um, and ultimately her body just kind of gave out and that was it. Yeah. But you got, God gave you an opportunity to extend that grace and to show it to her, not only extend it from your pers perspective yours and Kai's perspective, but, um, his grace, I think I'm with you on that. And she, she has to, she has to have been, have felt that peace. Yeah. She has to have known that Holy spirit moment in whatever way she experienced it to know that she is adopted. Mm. Yeah. Right. Just yeah. like you were adopted That's and, right. and, and I am. So, that's got to give you great peace. It does. It does. I think there was multiple levels. It was so special to me. One, I've got the peace of, I got to connect with my birth mother. Spent 20 years. And if she would have passed away without that connection, I think I would have held that regret for a long time. Um, but then I also saw the peace of God in her life. And so that gives me a, a greater peace um, than I could have ever imagined. I never thought I would get that opportunity, but not only did I get an opportunity to connect with her, she lived with us and she got to see my world. She got to see me preach. She got to see my wife. Um, and she got to see a lot of our life. That's awesome. The way that you guys were able to change your mother's life and spiritual perspective, given all that had happened to that point. I think that's just fantastic. That is, praise God for that. That is just yeah. a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And it seems like the Spence family has just been so gracious during this whole time. And I think about what happened for you and your brother by their relentless pursuit of you. Mm. Their relentless pursuit of you. There's so many parallels yes. <laughs> between your life and the spiritual journey. Yeah. Yeah, there is. It's it's really remarkable. It is. It's something I, I, I use in my ministry a lot, and the Lord has taught me, continues to teach me every day. I, I get emotional often talking about my story because it reminds me so vividly of what the gospel does to us. Yeah. It not only rescues us, it it not only redeems us, but it makes us family members. It gives us a new family. And it, it puts within us not only the reality and the knowledge that you've been rescued from a situation, 
but the affections that you've got a father. Um, and for someone who didn't have a father, not only did my new father make all the difference in my life, like my spiritual uh, growth is so, now I tell folks I was hard headed and the Lord knew it. So he gave me a story that made me know the gospel. And the gospel is that you did not save yourself. You were in need and someone came and rescued you. That is just as Romans 5.12 says, just as sin came into the world through one man and so death through sin. Like it just reminds me that I am a sinner. I have no, no thing in me that is going to redeem, that is going to save me. And Jesus came and he lived a life I couldn't live. And he died a death that I should have died for my sin, but that he rose, he defeated death. He rose from the dead. And in his new life, I have the power to, I have the purpose to live a life that, that I otherwise could not. And it's not by any righteousness in me, but it's by the righteousness that Christ afforded me. And so my story is just a reminder that the place I am today is nothing I did. And the environment that I live in today it's nothing from me. Um, it was it was given to me, and it's a great, great gift. And so I, I, I use that in my ministry. I use it in my own personal life. And uh, it's a reminder um, uh, that, that the gospel is about much more than rescue. It's about family. It's about God being Father, putting, putting the spirit within us that cries out, Abba, Father. Yeah, you weren't, you, you were a six-year-old kid, man. You didn't. You didn't make those decisions. You didn't sign those papers. You didn't buy that plane ticket. You didn't do any of that stuff, That's right? right. He, he, Mr. Spence pursued you. The Spence family pursued you yeah. and got you and brought you into a new family, adopted you, grafted you in. Yeah. And um, what grace that is and what a great story. And it, but, it, but I guess it doesn't end there, though, right? Because cause you were Quan Irvin then. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I, um, you know, I told you I was a ward of the state of Alabama, and um, and so my last name didn't change. And I remember there, I told you I have some connections in Oklahoma. There was a family, the the so the very family that connected my family, the the Spences, to the Native American ministry. Um, there was a the father of that family. His name was Bill Barnett, one of my heroes. He passed away. Uh, as a result of COVID last uh, earlier this year. But Bill Barnett, I remember even in high school, maybe it was middle school, he pulled me aside one time and he says, you know what, I think you should change your name. I think you sh- your last name should be Spence. And for, you know, a, a young teen, that didn't really land on me. Like I, I, I thought about it, but that, who's going to change their name? At that, at that point in my life, it just wasn't something I even comprehended, I don't think. And years later, it was actually when I was getting married. I asked um, uh, my wife to marry me. I was an Irwin at the time. And when it came time for me to get married, I thought, you know what? I'm going to marry this girl and we'll probably end up having kids. And I'm going to give them a name. And it's as it stands, it was going to give, I was going to give them the name Irwin, which I, you know, I didn't have anything against, but also wanted the name Spence was that your down. Was that your biological yes. father's name? Okay. It was ahead. my birth mother's name. Birth mother's yeah. name. Okay. And so um my father uh was doing the wedding. He's a pastor, right? And so um at the rehearsal dinner, he goes to the rehearsal, he does a great job and I tell him that at the reception we're about to have a meal together. I said, Dad, you said everything great. It went phenomenal. I can't wait for it tomorrow, but you said one thing wrong. And I pulled out my legal name change documents. I always get emotional telling this <laughs> every time. And I got emotional then big time. Everybody did. But I pulled out my legal name change documents. I said, Dad, tomorrow I don't want you to announce the Irwins. I want you to announce the Spences. And here we made it official. And I showed him the legal name change documents. And so that well, was when I was 26. And so I didn't have the name Spence until seven years ago. What and, did he do? Oh man, the whole room melted. I was melting and my parents were bawling and the whole, we had a bunch of people there and it was beautiful, beautiful reminder of my story. And, uh, I think a beautiful way to honor them and all that they did for me. 
and my fam- my my brother. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was a, a special time, a special memory. But doesn't that continue the parallel, right? Yes. So yeah. you're in the family, but you essentially took on the name. Yeah, yeah. You became a new creation. Yeah. It's almost like you elevated your uh, connection. And when that happened, the father was so overcome with joy. It's like the prodigal son. Now, you weren't a prodigal son, but the guy's waiting there. And he throws the biggest party. And he holds him. and, And it's the most grand celebration. And that's what I believe God does when we turn to him. Yeah. It is that sort of emotional type celebration. Your parallel to the faith journey, your life story and the parallel to the faith journey is just unreal. It's just unreal. It's a great reminder for me personally. It's something I hope to continue to use personally in my life, but also uh, in my ministry. It's just a perfect illustration, right, to say, uh, here's the gospel. And my life is, is an example of that. And that, the Lord gives us Graces like that in all of our lives. I know, you know, you don't have to have my story to be able to proclaim the gospel faithfully. The, the Bible even uses marriage as a great illustration of the gospel. You know, it uses uh, a, a lot of things, and I just have the opportunity and the grace to use what otherwise would have been a really sad story as a story to say, um, uh, "Here's the gospel." You know, I, I I think of John nine. When, you know, there was a bad situation where this guy was blind. Uh, John nine, this guy was blind and. You know, someone asked, why was this man born blind? And Jesus responds, it's so that the works of God would be displayed in him. And, you know, I wasn't born blind, but I was born in an unfortunate circumstance and spent some years in an unfortunate circumstance. But why? It was, I think, that the works of God might be displayed in my story. And so I hope to continue to herald that um, as it pertains to God's word. Uh, because I think that is what I have an opportunity to do is say, here's God's word. And here's an illustration of that. Um, you know, even adoption, uh, Galatians talks about adoption a lot. There's other places that talks about being an heir, um, to, you know, to Christ. Um, and, and I think there is something to be said about what you said earlier is that the parallel continues like there adoption does a lot of things. And one of those things is the status change. And I think my name change was indicative of a status change. Now, I know it didn't completely parallel my adoption, my spiritual adoption, but it I can point back to it and say that's exactly what spiritual adoption does. There's a, a status change. You were an enemy of God, and now you're a son of God. You know, and and the name represents that. Your salvation represents that. And so yeah, I think the Lord's always showing me more and more parallels, and it's something I hope to keep unpacking for the rest of my days because it it keeps me mindful of all the Lord has done, not only physically in my life, but but spiritually. Man, talking about the least of these, you guys were a couple of little kids born from a what some might consider a mistake, right? through this whole thing to where you are right now. That is that is the way God works. Mm-hmm. It just is. Yeah. And I, I think um, we get, I don't know, we get concerned with pedigrees and status and all those other things, but you know, you think back through Scripture, some, most of the amazing things that occurred and people in leadership positions uh, came from the lowliest of places. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The very savior of the world was born in poverty and literally had to be laid in a feeding trough. Right. Yeah. Scripture says uh, he uses the weak to shame the strong and the foolish to shame the wise, something like that. Um, and I, my life is certainly proves that. It certainly proves that. Um, even my call to ministry, like it took me years to get to the point where I would say I'm called to be a pastor. My initial call to ministry was just, I feel convicted about serving the Lord. And I would just balk at the idea of standing in front of people. I mean, I had a lot of insecurities, a lot of shyness, things I had to wrestle through. Um, and continue, like the Lord continues 
to show me that he's using those type of people. Now he's going to also use the very gifted person for, for sure. But you know, that's that my life just continues to prove that he uses the weak things of the world. Is that your message? I mean, when you look at this thing overall, I always like to get to what the person's message is and the fact that yours parallels the spiritual life or whatever else it is. Is is that your message? What other message is? There's lots. I think, um, again, I, like I said, I, feel like I'm unpacking more as life as I as I grow more in the scriptures as I grow more in my knowledge about how the world works I think I'm finding more and more about what my message is with regard to what the Lord did to me spiritually and physically some of the things I think about is the importance of our mercy ministries in the church that James 127 talks about this is true religion and it's caring for the orphan and the widow now it's not only those two things I think he was using those two things James is using those, the orphan and the widow, to to point to the least of these. Right. Because those are people who are helpless. Those are, in society even today, those are um, people that, that, that need help, that are likely not going to have anybody. And so I think it's important to put our faith to work. And that's what my parents did. He's one of the hardest working people I know. And if anybody deserved a summer vacation to the beach, it was him. But he took his family to California and Oklahoma and ministered to folks. And so now looking back, I, he got it from those mornings waking up and reading his Bible. And he just said, we're going to do that. And he didn't, he, he doesn't pastor a huge church. He worked by vocationally his whole ministry and he retired from a corporate job, but now he, well, it wasn't a corporate job. It was a factory job. Yeah. And now he's still pastoring, but he's still going on those trips. Um, to this day, he's retired now, and he's still going on those trips. And and it's just a reminder that our mercy ministry is is important. My wife and I have a uh, desire to adopt or foster, and so it's it's two things. One, we we're trying to do what our dad did, and that was read the Bible. But also, we saw it modeled by him. And so, one of the things I get is is mercy ministry, caring for the least of these. But there's a lot more. Um, it's helped me develop patience with other cultures. It's helped me develop patience with people who are living a life of recklessness. It's helped me overcome insecurities and therefore help others overcome insecurities and say, look, you can be confident. You can trust the Lord is going to use you. You don't have to own an identity that says it's less than you are. You have an identity in Christ and you can overcome your insecurities. Um, it's helped me be a question asker. Because I know what people asking me questions did, and it pulled things out of me that helped me get to a point where uh, I would I want to help people, where I want to share my story to help others, and so I I tried to be intentional about uh, questions I ask people and go to people even though I'm naturally an introvert, I want to ask some questions, and I'm still growing in that. Um, it's helped me to be a person of forgiveness and to say you can forgive too. Um, the Bible calls us to it for one, and I've also had to do it in my life in a big way. It's helped me overcome, I, I think, process racism. I went to an all-black school, went from there to an all-native school. Even there, I experienced racism because I wasn't the right tribe. Hmm. And the tribe I was part of, I was only half. And so there was factors there that even there I faced racism. And then I went to an all-white school in Alabama as a brown guy, and I experienced racism. And so there's things there that help me and my story helps me process and helps others process and relate. And, um, and that's one thing I get to relate to a lot of different people, whether they're extremely poor, ethnic, even, even wealthy, you know, my parents did well. My mom was a pharmacist and my dad was at a company for 50 years and ended up retiring as the plant manager. And so they did well. And so I, I get a wide range of connections with folks through my story. And I think some of the big ones are just God's sovereignty, just a trust. You know, every time people get up in arms sometimes when they talk about God's sovereignty, I think every time you see it mentioned in scripture, especially by people like Paul, you see Paul bring it up by way of giving people something to have peace in saying God is in control. He brought you to salvation. So you can't just lose it. No, he's going to keep you. He's going to be faithful to you. He puts you in this position. So don't fret. He is sovereign. 
Um, and so it's just helped me to have a really solid and confident belief that we have a sovereign God. Uh, he is providential and that he is working things out for his glory. And so, um, yeah, yeah. And then, and then like we mentioned already, just the parallel of adoption, um, that I didn't do anything to gain my faith. Mm. I didn't do anything to gain my new family. No, I was just helpless and I was rescued. And, um, and so that parallels with the gospel that we are in Christ righteous. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. It's only in Christ that we have that righteousness given to us or on us. Yeah. I don't think I'd be here if the Spences and particularly my dad didn't spend intentional time in his word yeah. on his knees in prayer and going on mission with his local church. Like those basic elements are the things that he did for years that culminated in my story. And I don't ever want to miss that point. Those times I saw him on the knees didn't just start when he brought two boys in. No, they were actually the motivating factor to bring us in. You know? Yeah. Well, and, and that's what we need to model now. Yeah. Those of us with, with kids and that are going to have kids and um, that influence others, um, we need to set a higher standard. Mm. We've got we to gotta set a higher standard because when we do, um, we don't know the impact that it's going to have in this world. Yeah. We just yeah. don't know. Yeah. We trust that it does because that's how God works. But um, we've got to set a higher standard, and uh, it sounds like that's exactly what your dad did, and it sound like, sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Well, I've got a lot to learn, like we all do, um, but I've certainly had some terrific models in my life. Like I said earlier, the Lord knew I was hard-headed. He gave me a story where my physical adoption paralleled my spiritual adoption. He also knew I was hard-headed and need a lot of mentors, and so I had mentors growing up. I had lots of mentors uh, in New Orleans and North Carolina, people that took very intentional time with me to not only teach me about ministry, but to ask me hard questions to be just in my life. And so, um, man, that, and you didn't ask that, but man, get yourself around people that are going to love you in a way that's not always easy and sometimes going to feel abrasive, but ultimately it's going to refine you. And that's what the Lord brought in my life. Quanah Spence, you um, have taken a beautiful route that wasn't easy. And God has pulled you and shown you and shaped you. And it's a story that a lot of people, that had they gone through, would be a justification for a spiraling out of control. But you view it as grace. Mm, yeah. And for that reason, uh, you're in this place. And uh, your perspective is fantastic. And uh, it is of God. And, and you are obeying. And you are listening. And you are um, growing at the same time. And we are fortunate to have had you here and to be able to talk through this stuff. And um, I, I can't express enough gratitude for you taking some time out today. I know it's a little in, in between semesters and yeah. for college uh, ministry, and so hopefully it's you've got a little bit of downtime. But yeah, it was a great time, man. I am really excited about what you're doing. I'm just honored to be able to share my story. Um, and I say my story; it's all from the Lord. He, yeah. he. Uh, <laughs> I'm just sharing what happened. I was, I was a spectator. Uh, maybe a little bit closer than everybody else, but I was a spectator to what the Lord was doing, and so I'm happy to share that. Yeah, but you, you submitted to Him, right? And and you you followed, and you didn't buck against this too hard in 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 ways that um, that you just said I, I'm going to be God. Yeah. You, you had a model yeah. of humility, and that's been that's who you've become. And because of that submission and and your desire to align with the will of God, uh, He's so strongly moving in your life and and because of that he's moving through you into college kids and into um congregations and into the people that are going to listen to this and all the other places and so it's just god math right it's multiplying out in right. in, in all these directions and it's just a beautiful story and we're thankful for it thank you thank you for having me on today 
In so many cases of adoption, the hopeless are given an impossible hope through a love that also seems impossible. That's what happened to Quana and his brother Kai. The trajectory of their lives radically changed when the Spence family pursued and adopted them. It should make us consider how and where we might more radically love the hopeless. And I think it's important to note that the Spence family didn't scour the earth to find someone to radically love. They just responded to the two who God placed right in front of them. Imagine the possibilities. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. We hope and pray that you see where God is moving in your life. We're certain that He is. You know, we're looking for people with impactful, faith-shaping stories, and we need your help. If you know of even one story that is moving and should be shared for the kingdom of God, or if you just have feedback from episodes you've heard, please reach out to us at astrongerfaith.com slash connect or on Facebook or Instagram. We'd really love to hear from you. Until next time, we pray for peace and a stronger faith for you and those you love.